Hello everyone, Nordic Beast here, and welcome back to the channel. I'm gonna try something different today. In past videos, people have mentioned that they like my historical content in videos about War Thunder, so I wanna try my hand at purely historical content and see how you all feel about it. Today, I'm gonna be covering the Supermarine Seagull. No, 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 not that Supermarine Seagull, this one. However, to get to the Seagull I want to talk about, I need to look at the company that built it first. Supermarine was founded in 1913 as the Pumberton Billing Company to build motor launches. They were located near Woolston, Southampton, England. Their first aircraft would be a single engine biplane described as a boat that will fly, though the aircraft likely never flew and was dismantled. They'd even designed such aircraft as the Nighthawk, an interesting concept of extreme endurance, a spotlight, and a recoilless rifle for bringing down German airships. In 1916, the company would be sold and renamed Supermarine Aviation Works. Under this name, the aircraft would be known for its various racing seaplanes that would win multiple Snyder Cups in the late 1920s. 1928, Victor's Armstrong would take over the company and they would become known as Supermarine Aviation Works Vickers. During this time, the company would build mainly flying boats and even the very famous Supermarine Spitfire. In 1921, Supermarine would design and build the SEAL-2, a reconnaissance flying boat built to the British Air Ministry's specifications. This, in turn, would lead to the development of the Supermarine Seagull, this was rejected by the Air Ministry. After some changes, a limited run of 34 aircraft were built, and this niche of flying boats would help Supermarines stay afloat during a difficult time to build aircraft. In late 1921, both the SEAL-2 prototype and one of the Seagulls were both sold to Imperial Japan. In 1929, design work for the Supermarine Walrus would begin as a private venture, this flying in 1933. This aircraft would go on to be the workhorse of the Royal Navy with 740 aircraft built and being used well into the 1950s, mostly by civilians. In the late 1930s, Supermarine then designed the Supermarine Sea Otter as an improvement and possible replacement for the Walrus. Due to the production of the Walrus and the Spitfire, the Sea Otter wouldn't fly until 1938 and production wasn't ordered until 1942. 292 were built, and it never even came close to replacing the walrus. In October of 1940, the British Air Ministry issued another specification to both Supermarine and Ferry for a catapult-launched amphibian reconnaissance and spotting aircraft to replace the Supermarine Walrus and Sea Otter. This led to the Supermarine Type 381, three prototypes of which were ordered as the Seagull in 1943. Many design delays would happen over the course of the Seagull's development, starting with the Supermarine Design Office moving after a bombing. Many delays were caused by wind tunnel testing after changing from the Rolls-Royce Merlin to the larger and more powerful Rolls-Royce Griffin. Finally, the aircraft specifications and role would change in 1944, the role being changed from ship-based reconnaissance and gunnery spotting to land-based air-sea rescue. This change removed the original four-gun turret. Due to delays, the first prototype wouldn't fly until July 14, 1948. The second prototype flying a year later and was used for carrier trials. The aircraft was not accepted for service, as with its cousins, being replaced by the first generation of helicopters. The aircraft itself, however, was rather innovative. It featured counter-rotating propellers, which eliminated drift due to a single prop rotation. The wings were fitted with slotted flaps, full-length leading-edge slats, and the wings had variable angle of incidence, pivoting at the front spar much like the later Vought F-8 Crusader. The wing could also fold up for ship storage. All these innovative design features had previously been tested on the Supermarine Type 322, a torpedo dive bomber prototype. The Seagull was tested flying as slow as 35 miles an hour. In 1950, the aircraft flew in an Air League Cup race and gained the airspeed record for amphibious aircraft over a 100km course by flying an average speed of 241.9 miles per hour. As an amphibian, 
The aircraft featured retractable landing gear that could also be removed, saving the aircraft up to 400 pounds of weight. The Seagull also featured an arrestor hook for carrier landings and even tested with JTO rockets. The aircraft was meant to carry a crew of three, a pilot, a navigator, and a medic. A second pilot's position with a folding seat was available, and the aircraft could carry up to seven passengers. The Seagull had a maximum speed of 260 miles per hour at 12,000 feet, and would cruise at 130 miles per hour, with a climb rate of 1,400 feet per minute, and a cruising range of 875 miles. The Seagull seems to be the pinnacle of a small niche of aircraft that are often overlooked in history, saving many downed airmen and sailors' lives. Unfortunately, the Seagull was too late, and with the dawn of helicopters, seaplanes would seem to be gone from military service around the world. Upon discovering this aircraft, I fell in love with it. I think it's gorgeous. It also has a greater cruising speed, cruising range, and passenger capacity of any helicopter of its day. And had it actually entered service, I think it would have had a long and successful career. And I, for one, feel this aircraft was a missed opportunity.